Hey everybody, I'm very excited to bring you this next two-part series on self-leadership. It is a concept that was pioneered by Professor Charles Manns almost 40 years ago. And through these four decades of research, a lot of practical and applicable advice has been presented in the science behind it, and I'd like to share this with you so that you will be able to take your life and your business to the next level. There are three categories of strategies that you can implement in order to grow and develop your self-leadership skills. Firstly, you have your behavior-focused strategies. Secondly, natural reward strategies. And the third one, constructive-focused strategies. So because of the nature of the vastness of this research, I'm going to highlight only the behavior-focused strategies so that you can click on the subscribe button and hit the bell notification icon if you'd like to find out more about the subsequent series that will happen in a day or so. So let's dive into the behavior-focused strategies. In total, there are five key sub-strategies within this category. Number one, self-observation. Number two, self-goal setting. Number three, self-reward. Number four, self-correcting feedback. And number five, self-cueing. I'll go through each of them in turn. Number one, self-observation. It's a very funny thing, but when you start to observe yourself, you get into a metacognitive state by noticing what you're doing. Self-observation has a corrective mechanism that enables you to look at yourself and give yourself some kind of feedback. When you are able to observe your own actions with an honest eye, all you're doing is you're telling yourself what else you can do in order to improve that situation. One of the strategies in neuro-linguistic programming that I often use is something known as the third position. The third position is an observer position where I deliberately step out of myself and pretend that I'm observing myself. In fact, you can try that now. So imagine that you are your camera looking back at you and try to hold that space inside of your mind. Some people can do it very well, some people can't, and I'm one of those that can't quite do it very well. However, as I attempt to do so, I can watch what I'm doing, I can observe my own facial expressions as if someone is giving me feedback. This kind of self-observation is also about noticing my patterns of behavior through time. For example, if I make terrible decisions, then I'll have to observe that those terrible decisions frequently lead to negative outcomes. And once I notice this pattern, I can step back, observe myself and say, what can I do about this? This allows me to have the volition and choice to take a direction and a set of behaviors that will get me some different results. Number two, self-goal setting. There's been more than two decades worth of goal-setting research that's been done, pioneered by Gary Latham. Now, one of the challenges, however, is most people don't know how to apply goal-setting because they think it is a natural thing. It is not. It's not that you have it or you don't. It's not just writing down something on a piece of paper. The truth is, crafting a clear vision for yourself and making sure that you follow the SMART directives, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound, are the key elements to being able to audit your own goals and to be able to check whether or not you're really pushing yourself. After all, setting goals that you know that you will achieve are only going to spoil your motivation for it. If you set goals that are slightly more challenging, you're likely to have a higher drive and motivation for it. As a result of having goal-setting strategies that are self-cued and independent, what you will be able to look forward to is the ability for you to set regular goals in order to accomplish daily, quarterly, yearly tasks that will then push you towards a sense of progression. This is the case especially if you're also observing yourself, which is tip number one, so that you can assess whether or not your goal is on track or not as a result of your internal observation of your external behaviors, you will be able to better accomplish the goals that you set for yourself in tandem with all of your internal reflections. Of course, this requires the third thing, which is self-reward. Self-rewards are something as simple as giving yourself a psychological pat on the back whenever you accomplish something. Another one is to write down inside what Jack Canfield calls a victory log where you list down all the things that you've accomplished and you feel really good about yourself. This approach sometimes gives you that dopamine hit that demonstrates that you are actually progressing towards the things that are meaningful for you. On other occasions, it might actually be giving yourself a physical treat. Take for example, myself. Every time I look into my clients' folders and attempt to work through them, I sometimes find that I need that drive and motivation. So 
After I go through that documentation, I give myself a well-deserved break and sometimes I take a break or so after every two hours of working. Now this is important to me because sometimes I need a break in order to get work done. Sometimes I reward myself with a break in order for me to get work done. So I discovered that when I'm giving myself this reward, I'm actually training my mind to expect the reward only after I've gotten my work done. Take for example, my physical fitness routine. There are some days where I work out so intensely that I feel the delayed onset of muscle soreness a couple of days later. That's when I know I will take it easy. I won't go the full seven or eight sets of exercises. Instead, I will simply do maybe two or three sets of exercises for maintenance, and then I'll give myself a break and give myself a pat on the back. The fourth thing is self-correcting feedback. Now we realize that the third position can give us observer's feedback from your own standpoint, which is a form of self-observation and reflection. Now those are typically across patterns of behavior. So sometimes you don't want to wait until you get the outcome in order to correct yourself. Now this is where a lot of internal self-talk comes into the picture and I've done some videos on the topic of self-talk which you can find in my playlist. When you're able to constructively self-examine, you can turn your failures and unproductive behaviors into lessons and areas for improvement, which will then give you a new set of goals to work towards. So you'll notice how powerful these interrelated concepts are, because once you're able to self-correct, your goals are going to be within grasp. However, it is necessary for you not to pummel yourself with too much negative criticism. As we all know, this is a lack of self-compassion which can lead to feelings of guilt and inadequacy and as a result, your motivation to even want to try those goals goes down. So I highly encourage a self-compassionate approach to observing almost as if whatever unproductive failures you've encountered are nothing more than a fact to be worked on. And as a result of that, it makes it so much easier for you to treat it as something that needs to be done on a to-do list, on your calendar, so that it becomes cookie cutter every single day. The last strategy is self-queuing. Now, self-queues are sometimes just reminders. What you see as a post-it note on your kitchen door to say what you need to buy uh, for groceries this week is one of these things. Sometimes you might have it as an alarm notification on your digital calendar. However, these are things that sometimes work and sometimes don't. Take for example, whenever I receive a notification on my calendar to go work out, does it always mean that I will work out or do I sometimes slack off? And sometimes I realize that entrepreneurs, business owners and anyone in a professional career might respond to a cue and sometimes they just don't. So sometimes those cues don't work. So it's not just about the cues, it's what happens inside your mind that enables those cues to take place effectively. Take for example, waking up in the morning. When the alarm goes off, do you automatically jump out of bed? Well, maybe it's because you didn't think about the actual procedures that enable you to jump out of bed. So one of the things is, take that cue, you know that there's gonna be a specific alarm, notice what you will do when you hear. So if you hear the alarm, you see yourself getting up and walking out to the washroom to freshen up. So that's something of a procedural base that makes things very concrete for your mind to execute. I've realized that every time I don't execute on something, it's largely because it's just a vague thing, like do something nice for my parents or go grab lunch. What does that mean? How about going to this specific store and ordering this particular food and come back by a specific time? that tends to kick into action something a little bit more effective. Likewise, sometimes when I write the phrase, complete my book, what book specifically? Write article. What article specifically? If I can see inside my mind the title that I'm supposed to write and the specific steps. For example, I have a standard procedure of reading, doing some research, and then thinking it through and that takes approximately 30 to 45 minutes of my time and then I can produce an article that is worth of other people reading. Sometimes it happens on the spur of the moment but that's an alternative strategy where I have to go back into my calendar and decide which are the things that I need to shift in order for me to stay on track with everything else, especially since now I'm interrupting it with something that was unplanned. So overall, the idea of having cues may seem to be an external thing. However, I need to have a concrete set of steps inside my mind and a set of procedures. So if you haven't been able to do it, maybe it's because you don't know how to do it effectively yet. Take for example, this entrepreneur. 
who really wanted to make good decisions but just didn't know how to make good decisions. So instead of sitting down and listing out what he needed to do, he, he just took action based on whatever state that he had. Instead, I would highly recommend that if you are self-cueing the wrong kinds of behaviors and you've got your internal observation lens on, what you have to do is stop, take a pause, and do some immediate reflection so that you can self-orientate to a more effective goal. Maybe sometimes you need to bounce it off a mentor figure or a coach in order for you to get a second opinion. But whatever the case, it's always better for you to make a decision in the right state rather than not. There you have it, the five key strategies within the behavior focused set of strategies on self-leadership. By utilizing some of these, not only could you imagine a much more productive future, you can also take better responsibility for yourself, your business and your relationships and take that to the next higher level in order for you to reap a greater sense of happiness, satisfaction and fulfillment in your life. Stay tuned for my second part of this series and I will see you in my next video.